China has been working on the digital version of the yuan since 2014, and there is talk that the central government hopes to launch a form of e-currency for the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics. That's why a screen shoot of an internal mobile application showing a digital banknote attracted so much attention on social media. For now, the digital yuan is just theoretical, but how would it affect our daily life? Are digital currencies safe? Do China's efforts to create a cashless society resemble what is happening elsewhere in the world? Why this drive to go digital at all? To talk about these issues, I'm joined by satellite by Professor Jeffrey Towson, host of Jeff's Asia Tech Class, and by Skype by Qi Qiang, Assistant Director of the International Monetary Institute at Renmin University of China, and Maria Dermetsis, Deputy Director at Brussels-based economic think tank, Brugel. And that is our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Zhou Yue. And before we delve into details about uh, this digital currency, Ji Chang, could you please explain to us in layman's language what is a digital currency? Well, digital currency is actually a very, very wide dis uh, concept. Well, if you try to understand it, just look at what you're using every day. You try to pay your bill, you try to shop on the vendor, and uh, you use your mobile phone, you just swipe the code, and then you get the payment or you paid it up. That's a digital currency. So any kind of the currency is in form of the digits is kind of the digital currency, but it has more contents. For example, we're talking about the Bitcoin is a kind of a digital currency. We're talking about the electronic payment. You pay your real dollar or RMB in digital form, that's digital currency. And what we're talking about today, I think, is the central bank issued the official digital currency. This is also kind of digital currency. So a form can vary, but uh, in essence, it's using the digital form to receive or pay out a payment. Mm. So this makes it more uh, convenient and fast. And also, another question is the timing. We're still in the thick of the COVID-19 COVID uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, why did the central bank want to try out the digital currency now? Well, actually, if you look at the data, you find out in our current economy, the online shopping has become a much more trend. Well, out of a lot of people's imagination, a lot of people think, wow, I'm shopping on Amazon, I'm shopping on Alibaba, on Telva. Uh, shopping online is kind of a, a everyday life. But actually, you are wrong. Let me tell the statistics. According to China, which is online shopping big country, we only have 12% of the daily retailing consumption is coming from online. So most of the people actually still favorites uh, offline shopping. But currently we have an issue, the COVID-19 outbreak. You know how much cash will have been uh, burned out or demolished on the banking system, do you know that? We have actually burned a lot of more than billions of the cash note because they have the potential contamination of the COVID-19 uh, virus. Mm. So this become a challenge in the physical bank note. It's the dirty money while well, we're mm. talking about the real dirty money. A lot of contamination, germs we're talking about. So digital form is actually good for the online shopping. It's mm. good for uh, you know hygiene payment. So why not using the digital form? All right, and this has also generated a lot of talks on the internet. Let's take a look at what some of the social media users have been talking about. China is running. A digital currency uh, piloting program. Uh, Devin Shah, uh, this is as huge as the invention of fiat money and moving away from the gold standard in 1971 with the potential to change what we today call money. Uh, so, Jeffrey, uh, will this change how we understand money and what exactly money stands for? Yeah, the interesting thing about China in particular is, you know, we're already about 75% of the way there. Everyone pretty much reaches for their smartphone. We don't really reach for our wallets anymore. Mm -hmm. We all use mobile payment for most things. I mean, we're almost already there. I mean, the whole point of a wallet was to carry your cash. A lot of us don't even carry wallets anymore. So, you know, the idea that I'm going to pay for something with my phone is pretty natural. And that wasn't the case three years ago. This is a pretty new thing.
Mm. So for a lot of consumers, I don't think this is going to be that big a deal. It might be a bigger deal in terms of the government side, in terms of transparency, in terms of cross-border transactions. But you know, going to the shopping mall in Shanghai, I mean, we're already kind of living this way, anyways. Can you explain what is the difference between、uh, paying with the digital currency issued by the central bank and、uh, bitcoins, the cryptocurrencies, and the AliPay, AliPay, and, and、uh, WeChat Pay payment system? What is the difference between those three? Right, like Bitcoin was kind of one extreme. It was the idea of an electronic currency, a digital currency, that was not. Fiat. It wasn't any, under any government control. No government could just print this currency,、mm. the same way certain governments around the world print money like it's nothing and devalue the currency. So that was kind of a separate idea.、Uh, you know what China is doing is a fiat currency that is under the Chinese government, and a variation on this would be Libra, which which Facebook tried to launch last year and didn't really happen. The idea of another fiat currency. But tied to a basket of currencies, not just one. So this would still be under the government,、uh, the central bank, the PBOC, and banks could issue more currency、uh, in this form, e-renminbi. But you, you can't do that with Bitcoin at all. And I don't see Bitcoin taking off in a major way. Most countries, whether it's China, the U.S., the U.K., or wherever, want some degree of control of the currency being used within its borders, which I think is quite rational. So it's a fiat currency. Then, if it is a fiat currency,、uh, we already have ways of paying with our WeChat and AliPay systems. Why do we have to pay with digital currency at all? Right. From the consumer side, it's probably a bit more efficient. I mean, we all go to our banks, we link our bank account to our WeChat account, we transfer some money in, and then we spend it. Okay, it's a little bit more efficient to get rid of that intermediate step. Uh, it's probably more significant from the other side of the government having,、mm-hmm. or WeChat or AliPay having more visibility into real-time transactions, or for moving money around outside of China, where we don't have to go through the Western banking system; it can just be done directly. So it, it's probably more important on that regard as opposed to, you know, just a regular consumer transaction in China. It's going to be pretty similar. And Chu Chang,、uh, what is the,、uh, in it for the government?、Uh, according to the Digital Currency Research Institute of the People's Bank of China, that's the central bank. It revealed that the central bank is already conducting the tests of this digital currency. It will probably use it for the 2022 Winter Olympics and probably put it in wider use later. Why does the government wants to have this trial? Well, actually. The government do need the trial, well, for a very long time. Well, let me explain it. So, well, this central bank issued fiat digital currency, we call the central digital currency, is quite different from the electric payment like the AliPay. It's more like the you know Bitcoin. It's kind of a real digital currency issued by the central bank. Well, first of all, you don't need a You don't need an electronic wallet. Well, let's say current bank electronic wallet. Now you use AliPay. You first you have to open a bank account through the normal bank, traditional bank, and then the bank will give you an electronic bank wallet, and then you can upload it to your AliPay or WeChat, and then you pay it. So basically, you still are using the traditional banking system, but with the current electronic、uh, digital currency, you don't need it anymore. You just need to install an app, and then you can put the digital currency into your wallet. There's no paper banking notes to back you up in the bank account. So this is totally new. And why we need it in the Winter Olympic Games? And before that, we also do small-scale pilot program. Why that? It's because it concerns a lot of things without a, a authorization from the bank or verification from the banking clerk. How can I verify who you are? And is it money laundering problems getting involved? So these are going to be problems we have to test before that.、Mm. And now I think Winter Olympic Games is a really important arena to test these currencies because as a foreigner who comes to China, they will find a lot of things that requires electronic payment, like you call a DD taxi, you call a、uh, you know the ride、uh, of your bicycles. You all need electronic payment. But as our current policies is forbid foreigners, you know, you go to China just to open account in the bank, you have to go a long process. 
So I think the, currently the central bank digital currency is going to solve the problem, and we can limit it in the use of a small scale in the Winter Olympics. So I think this consideration is actually very smart. But I presume uh, the digital currency is not designed to be used by foreign tourists. It must be widely used by Chinese. Why did the Chinese have to switch from payment via uh, WeChat or, or Alipay to a digital currency by central bank? Well, I think there are many considerations. Digital currency is actually the trend. Well, I think one thing is misunderstood is that uh, Everybody is saying the central bank is going to use the digital currency to replace everything, replace Alipay and WeChat, to replace even the paper banknote. That is totally wrong. Electronic payment, we're going to be still there. And the paper note, no doubt, we're going to be with us still for a long time. And this digital currency will be used to solve a lot of other problems. Like I mentioned, the temporary visit from the foreign friends into China, and they want to open a cash account without any bank account. So this is going to be a small-scale test for a very long time. And uh, they will go parallel with the current systems for a very long time as well. So don't worry about it. We're still going to walk and see. Hmm. And what about uh, security and privacy issues? Uh, a lot of people don't know much about this. Does this mean that the central bank knows how much money I earn, how much I spend, where do I spend it, and what way I'm investing? Well, for me, I think this is not already a problem. Uh, just take a look at Norway or Sweden. They have already probably achieved 100% cashless society. So for their society, the money laundry and the tax evasion has become a minor problem. I think all the government all over the world, including America, Japan, UK, and all the country you name it, they all have the same consideration, anti-money laundry, anti-tax evasion, and uh, not by saying we have lots of, you know, the corruptions going on and or the financial crime going on. So with the current uh, electronic payment like Alipay or Amazon payment, if we go 100% of this kind of payment, this problem can be solved. So if we use central banks digital currency, it will be the same case. So that would not be a new problem we're going to think about. But you, if you're talking about the traditional uh, breaches, like if the software been uh, breached, or the server has been hacked. Well, the same kind of problem will happen to the current electronic payment as well. And I think central banks' digital nodes with the blockchain technology will have a stronger hold to the security more than the current ones. And Jeffrey, uh, when technology is concerned, what are the new technologies that might be used if digital currency will be uh, put into white use? Right. I mean, one of the complaints you hear a lot are sort of cross-border transactions. I mean, if you're paying with renminbi within China, you don't usually have that many problems. You know, there's sometimes some fake currency, so this would obviously take care of a lot of that. But most of the problems you, you, you hear about are sort of cross-border, going outside of China, getting your money accepted, things like that. In theory, this could have a big benefit there. And, and even if it's even if you can do it today, if you ever look at the fees that get charged to transfer money across borders, it can be pretty ridiculous. I mean, you can see three, five, six percent, you know, cross-border fees. So there's a big efficiency to be captured just in the idea that, look, it really shouldn't cost anything to transfer money. I mean, it really shouldn't. It doesn't cost us any money when we hand a bill to someone in a store. There's mm -hmm. no fee for the transaction. The same should be true for electronic. It should be a frictionless activity, and it really isn't once you start moving you know, near the borders. So I think that's kind of going to be the big benefit, is this should all just be a lot cheaper for everybody. And, and about the currency use, while well, the Chinese yuan was adopted by the International Monetary Fund uh, Special Drawing Right, the SDR, uh, China plans to have digital currency. Uh, does that mean China is pushing to internationalize its currency even further and with more force? Jeffrey? Yeah, I mean, this has kind of been one of these big topics for the last 10 years is the internationalization of the renminbi. And obviously, being part of the reserve would be a major step within that. And we've seen some steps in that direction, which you mentioned. 
Yeah, there is this interesting idea that by going to an e-renminbi, and China will be the first country to really move this way in this scale. Mm -hmm. No other country is doing this this large right now. You could see how an e-renminbi might get a lot of traction across Asia, where 50% of tourists are Chinese. Uh, in terms of Belt and Road investment money could be done through e-renminbi. So you could see that this actually might make some pretty serious steps forward in terms of internationalization in certain areas. Ultimately, this is not, you know, the internationalization of the renminbi ultimately is not going to be a tech question. It's going to be a political question. The mm. UK is going to do what it wants to do. China is going to do what it wants to do. That's kind of politics more than, in, more than tech. But, yeah, I think it could accelerate a lot of interesting things, particularly in Asia. And Chu Xiang, I want your take on this because Jeffrey said it is a tech issue, not a uh, it is a political issue, not a tech issue. But of course, we know the technical system provides uh, better accessibility, better efficiency. That makes more sense for RMB to become an international currency. Well, I, I agree with Jeffrey, uh, but I have a further answer. I think this is not a tech issue in the first place, and later it's going to be. A political issue, but I think still, finally, ultimately, it's still going to be a tech issue. Why is that? A lot of people are afraid that uh, which country's uh, currency is to take the dominance of the world financial system, the conspiracy, blah blah blah. I'm totally against that. Well, from the bigger trend, I think in the future all the country will go on this road. Mm. I strongly support Chinese RMB to go to digital currency internationally or within the border. The same support goes with the U.S. dollar. Japanese yen, Korea won. Every yeah. country should do the same. Like Jeffrey has mentioned, that you can you imagine how much money we have to spend if I want to wire our money from China to the yeah. U.S. or from Tokyo to to uh, Tehran? That's a hum humongous cost. Mm. So we have to save the cost to lubricate the payment internationally, and not mentioning the benefit of seeing the anti-laundry effect. And money laundering effect and the corruption, money smuggling, all these problems have to be solved. I think even more urgent for USA. Do you know USA is the largest money or currencies, uh, you know, um, supporting money, uh, country in the whole world? But ever since we invented the modern monetary theory in the 1970s, it's like we invented something like nuclear energy, but we, without using how it actually works. Mm. We printed so much money into the world, and once America printed money uh, all over the uh, in the country, the money leaked out to Amer out of America immediately and it flooded all over the globe. Trust me, Fed doesn't want it. Fed sometimes print the money just to save its own liquidity crunch, not to flood the world. But he can't control it. He just can't know where the money goes. So they need a better tracker of where the money goes and uh, how it flows. So with digital currency, we for the first time have a marker and have a better tool to understand how the modern uh, money system are working. So I think this is actually urgent not only for China and for the whole world. All right. Thank you, Chu Xiang. Well, will this be a big trend for the world? Let's uh, take a listen to what some of the social media users have been saying about this reform and what it means for finance. Uh, Fred Kreiser, uh, there are clear indications that China is taking world's lead. They're gradually working on their money so that it replaces the dollar as international reference currency. Uh, let's come back to you, Jeffrey. Uh, Chu Qiang just mentioned uh, why it is important, because it is taking the lead in terms of financial institutional innovation. Uh, that's the trend for the whole world finance to go. Do, do you agree this is the world is headed? I think one of the, the fun things to think about here is where is this going to go? We're just at the very beginning. Like five years ago, ten years ago, this was all inconceivable. Mm. Chinese consumers didn't even have smartphones ten years ago. And look where we are now with mobile payment. Where could we possibly be ten years from now? Warren Buffett was actually asked this question about, uh, because he's a big investor in MasterCard and Visa, and they were very open. He's like, we don't know what payment is going to look like in five to ten years. Mm. We just don't know. You know, it's changing so quick. And, and then I think you have to give China a lot of credit. Uh, they're, in, they're out front on this one. Yeah. They're pioneering a fiat digital currency. We've never seen that before. Yeah. You know, this is just step one. And, and one example, so Jeffrey. Who knows what, 
uh, is that uh, Los Angeles uh, Times uh, run an article saying, uh, well, the Congress passed a two trillion coronavirus relief package, uh, but because of the outdated technologies, many of the money couldn't reach those uh, people as many wished. Still haven't received the $1,200 uh, relief package, but with digital uh, currency, that might be quicker and, f and more efficient. They probably have got the money already. Yeah, I I'm a U.S. citizen. I still haven't gotten my stimulus check. <laughs> They're mailing a physical check. That's to very Thailand. outdated. That's ridiculous. That's idiotic. I'm waiting for a check in the mail. Uh, the other, th one last point here. One thing to think about is. This is just the first step. When China pioneers this digital currency, it will unleash a lot of activity by other companies, the Alibabas, the Tencents. They will build on this and take it directions we probably don't foresee yet. So, you know, it'll be the kernel for a lot of things. It, it's going to be kind of amazing to watch. And also, you have to consider that there are 1.3 billion users going to use this currency or use this uh, digital uh, platform. That will generate a lot of applications and, and, and usages. In what sense do you think that will probably change how finance works in the future, Jeffrey? What, what kind of got my attention on, on the currency was, one, you have the government involved, you have the main banks involved. But you also have the major tech companies involved, the Alibabas, the Tencents. These are very innovative companies. They're going international on their own, and they're starting to bring in the multinationals. Like there's these rumors that Subway Sandwich and McDonald's might be involved, and they're trialing things in Xiong'an. Mm. And I mean, there is a, there's a big group of very sophisticated companies involved, and you've got a base of you know, a billion Chinese consumers that are using mobile payment plus a couple hundred million outside of China. So you've already got scale. I mean, you can do a lot of stuff when you have, the, you're not building something new, you're innovating on a big platform that already exists. Yeah. So I think we're gonna see a lot of sort of creative stuff happen out of that and the players are already around the table. And now we have uh, Maria Demetritz, uh, Deputy Director Brugel on the line. So, Maria, I know that some European countries, especially northern European countries, such as Denmark, Sweden, Finland, are uh, very close to becoming clashless societies because credit cards, online, and mobile payments are widely used. Uh, how is the European system evolving? What is the difference between the European uh, finance system and, and the Chinese system, which is now piloting a digital currency? I think you're right in saying that uh, a number of European countries are increasingly more uh, cashless, they're becoming cashless, but even they, and I'm here quoting uh, what's happened in Sweden, have realized that they cannot go totally digital, they cannot go totally cashless. Uh, there are good arguments that pertain to the fact that there are older people who are not very digitally savvy, mm -hmm. that are simply afraid of using uh, digital currencies. But there are also other arguments that are a lot more broad uh, uh, relevant, and that is that cash has also got a psychological value of confidence. And, you know, if you were to have a panic attack in a financial system, cash is always good to have. Um, and that is but you don't think it is too conservative to think that way? It's not for me to decide whether it's conservative or not. What I think is, uh, is, uh, is the case is that the policymakers are thinking about the fact that there will be a demand for some cash uh, if it were to come to a panic uh, uh, situation, in which case, you know, they need to prepare for that. Mm. Um, so that is one of the reasons why uh, the societies are not going totally cashless, but they're certainly going in that direction. But do you think European will come up with a system that is integrated, because you have a euro already, do you think Europeans will come up with a, with a European digital finance uh, infrastructure in the future? I think it's important to differentiate in between Europe and the euro because Europe is not the euro. It's going in this direction, yeah. but uh, Europe is a... Uh, so, you know, because we're talking about Sweden and Denmark, Sweden and Denmark do not have the euro, for example. So, uh, you know, you're not talking about those countries. Uh, countries in the eurozone, uh, the 19 countries that are currently in the eurozone, are contemplating uh, the creation of what they call a digital currency at the central bank level. This is very much at uh, the early stages of thinking, uh, so we are very far from implementing something like that. But as I said, the tendency is to become more digital, and therefore we need to prepare for something like that. 
And Jeffrey, it seems China is uh, taking the lead here because uh, we can almost say that many of the Chinese here are using uh, in, in, in their money digitally, but they don't, they don't pay with their cash. They pay with their phones. Uh, why is China uh, in the lead in this, and, and what does it mean for China? But China has, China has a couple of interesting Jeffrey, things. Jeffrey, please, first, Jeffrey, and then... Yes, but Jeffrey, China go ahead. China has a couple unique benefits, right? I mean, one, it's got scale. It's got everyone with a smartphone. And it turns out Chinese consumers are incredibly enthusiastic for everything on a smartphone. It's just true. They adopt things faster. They change faster than almost any country in the world. So it's, it's sort of ripe for experimentation in that regard. It's very, and then you have these giants like the Alibabas that, that make it relatively easy to roll out big ideas quickly. You, know, you can deploy something to hundreds of millions of people on one platform. Mm -hmm. And then you've got sort of top-down government action that is not always efficient, but it is usually pretty effective. So that's kind of unique to China. I don't know any other country that has all those pieces together. So they can do initiatives like this and they tend to be uh, successful, or they at least tend to happen. Somewhere like California, where I'm from, you know, we don't build, ra we, we don't build trains that well. You know, these government-led programs don't tend to work. Mm -hmm. By and large, they tend to work in China. So, you know, this is right in the strike zone of yeah. sort of the Chinese system. Uh, by the way, you should, Californians. And Maria, what is your take? I certainly agree with the first part, the technological adaptability of China. Is a techn China is really very much on the forefront of technological adaptability, and this is what has allowed it to take on board these new forms of technology faster than others. I think that uh, we observe this on many levels. Uh, I think in Europe also the, uh, most of the stuff now is done digitally anyway. So you have the euro, which is a non-digital currency, but a lot of the payments are done digitally, and mm. there, there is no need to think about a separate digital currency in this respect, because digital payments are already very much uh, a part of, uh, of our everyday life. And Jeffrey, I want to talk about the bigger picture because America used to be uh, very proud of a big power in terms of finance because of its embrace of innovation and new technologies. But obviously China is catching up with a lot of ingenuity and, and gusto there. Do you think this kind of a new trend will pose a challenge to American dominance in, d in finance and innovation? Well, I mean, China and the U.S. are, you know, in my mind, I think about them like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. Like, both were very, very good at what they did in their, you know, peak careers, but they were also very just different. I kind of think of the U.S. and China that way when it comes to tech. They're, they're both doing different things. Okay. The, the U.S. playbook is different. The Chinese playbook is different. But they both are kind of impressive in their own way. I don't know how to compare them, you know, apples to apples. What about the finance development in Europe, Maria? Well, uh, yeah, like I said, I mean, I think uh, there are two trends that we're observing. Uh, one is that we're becoming increasingly more digital. And the other thing is the digital currencies, which are not publicly issued, but are privately issued. Here you can think of things like the Libra, Libra. Uh, which, by the way, is is being stopped on its heels in Europe because it's not regulated. And the Europeans have effectively prohibited uh, Libra from taking on in, uh, in Europe because it wasn't regulated. Mm. Um, I don't believe that private currencies, and there I mean digital private currencies, will be able to challenge ever the monopoly of the state in terms of issuing currencies. I just don't think this is sustainable because a currency uh, needs to be backed by something. And no. here the, the monopoly of the state is extremely powerful in this respect. Um, however, I think the digital element of the currency is going to become increasingly more appealing. And, uh, you know, as the population becomes also okay. more increasingly Digitally this though, is uh, the trend. We're running well. out of time. Thank you very much, Maria, and thank you, Jeffrey. And this is Dialogue on CGTN. I'm Zoe in Beijing. Goodbye.